There we go. Uh, so we have sound now. Okay. So I want to recap um, before we go on with just the sort of forces that emerged in the um, medieval world that split uh, the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean, of course, had been the sort of glue that had held uh, Europe and Africa and the Middle East, sort of um, the Near East, together in a kind of single Greco-Roman kind of civilization. Um, and that continued until about the 7th to 8th centuries when uh, the expansion out of the Arabian Peninsula um, then sort of created this, this Christian North and this Islamic South. Um, and that pretty much geopolitically is still how the world is split. Now, obviously, both of these religions have expanded greatly, so we don't have North and South America in here or Africa or Asia. Um, but, um, and certainly they're not the, the, the only two, but, um, but in terms of the center of this ancient Mediterranean civilization, um, it is split now between uh, these two divisions. We talked about how um, water supply and family organization, really tribal or clan to use the Scottish term, organization, um, actually led then to uh, a specific pattern in the pre-Islamic uh, cities, and we see that as a dendritic pattern of streets rather than as a block pattern of streets, and it produced patterns that look like this with what we might call, this is Marrakesh, with what we might uh, call super blocks. Uh, in a dendritic system, you still have blocks, but as in North Fulton County here in Atlanta, the blocks might be 100 acres or something. They're just absolutely enormous. By comparison, uh, the blocks that we're on right here would be about four acres, right? So you would get these enormous blocks, or what later will be called uh, the super block. But if we get back up in here, what we see is coming off these primary streets, which may only be 10 or 12 feet wide, are actually moving back into these little cul-de-sac arrangements, which we talked about earlier. Um, and that is very old. It goes all the way back to these Mesopotamian cities, such as Ur, that we have here, going back to the third, fourth millennium uh, before the Common Era, or here in Assur, which is a little bit later, about 1300, I believe, showing then how these houses are developing here uh, off of this kind of dead-end tertiary street, which is coming off of a secondary street, which is leading into a primary street. So that um, there's a remarkable similitude between uh, the medieval city in the Islamic world and the medieval city in the Christian world because both of them, in a sense, sort of um, inherited the same things, even though the, um, the church would be different and the mosque would be different from a church and so forth, and there would be a school associated with the uh, a madrasa that would be, or a madrasa that would be um, associated with the mosque. Uh, likewise, the, the universities, modern universities, the University of Paris uh, gave birth to Oxford, we think, and, um, and that gave birth actually to Cambridge, and uh, we inherit that um, sort of, that from the medieval world. Um, originally, by the way, as a sidebar, you went to Oxford, or you went to Cambridge, and, um, and you got your baccalaureate degree, which meant you were then uh, admitted into your studies. Uh, have you ever wondered why when you leave a university, you, you, it's, the ceremony is called commencement, and commence means to begin? Isn't that funny? And it was only then that you were actually then admitted into uh, to study. The university was actually not in the colleges. The colleges were not organized by discipline. They were organized um, completely independently, really as residential complexes. And then the masters actually, um, the teachers actually then would give lectures in rented rooms in the city. And that actually is what gave birth to the sort of um, uh, organization of universities that we have today. We are organized, as most universities are in North America, by discipline. So there's a college of architecture and a college of business and a college of engineering. And within that are various schools. Um, at Cambridge today, for example, they're not organized that way. You, you apply to, uh, let's say, Magdalen College or St. John's or Trinity, 
And that's where you live. And you have to do research before you apply in order to know that if you want to study, let's say, French literature or uh, statistics, that that the that particular college has a master who is also in residence uh, and who can give you tutorials um, in, in your field of study. Your classes are actually taken in separate buildings which are collectively owned by all of the individual colleges. Um, it's funny how these things survive because, you know, when you graduate, you will have a, a robe and, a, and you'll get a hood if you're a PhD and so forth. These are medieval. These are m m monks basically, right, still retaining uh, the dress and the garb of these sort of uh, things that originally were associated with, uh, believe it or not, the church. Um, so I wanted to go through in some detail this remarkable city in Yemen, uh, which was closed to the outside world until about 1980, um, in which uh, Ron Lukak, who held the Aga Khan chair at MIT, was a professor at Cambridge, fellow of Clare Hall, uh, and then taught here at Georgia Tech for 16 years before he finally retired about four years ago. I uh, wrote a book. He was the T.E. Lawrence Professor of, uh, as in Lawrence of Arabia, at Cambridge before he took the Aga Khan chair at MIT. And um, he was one of the first people to actually be allowed into uh, Sana'a, this remarkable medieval city uh, that still retains its walls, that we can still see the citadel quite clearly, uh, there's a view of it uh, from a rooftop that we see here. And the great Friday mosque where every male must attend um, on Friday, um, which meant you had a lot of sh places to put your shoes um, so that um, because you couldn't, you couldn't enter to pray with your shoes on. Uh, this mosque, by the way, was constructed in the lifetime of the prophet. Uh, it's very old, and in the center you will see a uh, reliquary or repository, which is similar to if we were to look at the great mosque um, in Mecca, uh, where the Kaaba, which is what all the mihrabs are facing, is the Kaaba, and um, the holy city of Mecca. And um, these are all sort of in imitation of this. So this is the repository of wills. Uh, it is in the center of this very large uh, courtyard, which, of course, you had to clean yourself prior to entering uh, in order to pray. Um, as, uh, as an infidel, I would not be allowed in this because it is a functioning um, mosque. However, um, I was allowed in the madrasas or the madrasas, which are no longer functioning as they once did. Uh, this is actually in um, Fez, Morocco. This is the Carowin uh, Madrasa. And to imagine that you're walking through the street with um, pack animals and uh, a lot of um, feces from these pack animals uh, and urine and so forth in the streets, and then you walk the very narrow streets and you walk into one of these courtyards, and all of a sudden the world becomes completely silent and completely still. Absolutely beautiful. Just um, reflected images of paradise, in fact, uh, from the Quranic references, um, of which there are about 118 in the Quran. So these courtyards, everything opening up to the interiors uh, here open to the sky, very similar to uh, a Roman house or this ancient house form that goes all the way back to the Megaron um, that it was, was common throughout uh, the Levant, uh, what we now call the Near East and um, North Africa and on up into Turkey and so forth. Uh, the markets, of course, um, the mar uh, Sana'a is a large town, it's a capital town, so you have a very large market, people coming in to these covered uh, areas, sort of shopping malls, um, quite elaborate. There we see the street sort of entering into this and out the other side over here. Um, and these things are really colorful and really extraordinary. The, the odor, the smells are fantastic. Uh, there's a couple of building types that I would like to point to that are unique uh, to these, to the sort of medieval uh, Islamic world. Um, and again, these are not Islamic uh, institutions. The, the, these buildings that we're looking, the, obviously a mosque and a madrasa is, but um, th these are not. The, but it's in the Islamic world, okay? So that's a pretty broad uh, uh, territory. 
Uh, this is a um, uh, the Wakalat Bazaar that is in Cairo, medieval Cairo. And you'll notice that it's organized. In fact, it's market building or organized around this uh, open court with actually rooms to rent uh, actually on the top. Uh, this one was restored, actually. It's a World Heritage Site, a very famous one. And um, you can see there the organization of the, of, of the building type with an entrance. That This is the second floor, so you're actually entering here off the street and then moving into, um, into this courtyard. Um, other retail distribution would be like it was in Pompeii or like it was in Rome or, or any of these cities, Ostia. Um, and that is you have shops that open out to, to the street. This is Sana'a, one of the main streets actually in Sana'a. And uh, again, very, very, it's wonderful, very colorful. Uh, a lot of these shops would be very, very uh, shallow. They would be very small. You might have, um, it's not a good example, but in this one, let's presume that it's a tailor. And so you might have a depth of eight feet with uh, three people in there actually making a coat of some sort or making an article of clothing um, actually in the shop. Um, these, are, these markets, of course, had a highway network which stretched out from the city into the rural areas. And caravans, of course, would come in uh, for trade and so forth. And in certain circumstances, if you're far enough away, and this goes back to those embryonic sort of um, what Morris called in the medieval uh, European world the um, organic growth town uh, that would often develop around the market. Uh, I was in North Africa. I was actually in Morocco. And um, out in the middle of nowhere, I mean, just nowhere, uh, between the mid-atlas and the atlas, very flat, very dry, there's all of a sudden a market, you know. And no other buildings, no other, no residential functions, nothing. Just this huge market that was uh, sort of out in the middle of, with all kinds of people. I mean, selling everything, selling everything under the sun uh, that you could imagine. Did you, is the, you went to Clemson, Jennifer. Is the jockey lot still functioning up? It is. Anybody else know what the jockey lot is? Yeah, up, uh, up off I-85? Yeah, it's sort of like that. It's out in the, just a big open area, and everybody comes and sells everything, you know. Um, it's really amazing. So the problem with these caravans, of course, is that they're coming in on pack animals. Um, well, they were in the Middle Ages, so you had to have places to put them. And uh, a separate kind of uh, a, a sort of hotel developed, uh, which was sort of like a motel. Uh, today you might have a parking deck and then a place where you rent rooms. Uh, these were called caravanserai. Uh, they were quite, in some cases, quite elaborate. The ones in Syria and Iran in particular were quite elaborate. Um, and um, they're also known as the Khan, which is a title, actually, uh, in Syria. For some reason, I don't know why, but it's called a Khan in Syria. So you had these places to store the, um, the pack animals. There we actually see um, a bazaar with a caravanserai attached here in Sana'a. Uh, this is the entrance, and so the animals would come in, and they would be quartered on the ground floor uh, that we see down here. And then you would have these open courtyards that actually uh, gave light to the interior as well as to the exterior so that you could have, in some cases, as we'll see in a moment, a single loaded carter going around the courtyard like a peristyle, uh, going up three, four stories, and that would bring light into the corridor, and then the rooms would actually have windows that would open out um, to the exterior of the building envelope. Um, in some cases, they could be double loaded corridors so that you could get rooms that opened in both directions to get light into the rooms. The, um, so what you have, in a sense, is a parking deck down here, except it's for pack animals. Uh, in some cases, these were quite elaborate, such as um, the Karaj Caravanserai in Iran, or this one, which is absolutely beautiful in Damascus, uh, known as the Khan Assad Pasha, which obviously had a significant Byzantine influence uh, in its architecture. Really remarkably beautiful, incredibly beautiful, I think. So if we go into one of these, what we see is on the ground floor, very little light. This is where you're keeping um, your transportation. And then you go up the steps to, in this case, a single loaded, uh, this is in Sana'a. 
uh, a single loaded corridor with rooms opening to the right off of that corridor, and then in those rooms you would have windows that open to the outside. And then, of course, the, all these corridors open into these open courts. Uh, often in a caravanserai, a caravanserai would be a place of great social activity, sort of like when I was growing up, the pool hall in a small town or something where all the sort of retired people would go and sit around and play checkers or something, right? Um, and drink beer or do whatever. Here they're not drinking beer, they're drinking tea, although tea is very difficult to make in Yemen because of the altitude. It's difficult to boil water. Um, so great social activity around little, little taverns or, or um, um, a, a bar, cafe kind of a thing. Uh, here is the connection then of that single loaded corridor. We were in there just a moment ago coming across the, uh, the courtyard. This is open down to the level uh, with the animals. So there you see actually uh, one of the gates to keep the animals enclosed. And then here is actually the residential portion up above. And then here is the restaurant cafe, which is adjacent to that caravanserai and is a great center of social, of social activity with extremely good food, I might add. Um, if you've never had kefta kebab, you owe it to yourself uh, to do that. It's a lamb with spices that are cooked on a skewer. Uh, so here they are. That's me sitting. No, not really. That's um, where I would like to be at this point in my life, sitting there drinking tea and sort of shooting the breeze about, you know, how we're going to make the world a better place. Um, baths. This is uh, one of the neighborhood baths in uh, Cairo. And uh, there's a lot of speculation about where these bath types, because they are exactly, exactly like the way the Roman baths worked, um, with a hypocaust system that produced very hot water, heated uh, sauna-type conditions, uh, sweat rooms, in other words, and then cold, a cold bath to close the pores down, and so forth, and sort of a potateria where you would change clothes and sit, because you can't go directly from the... I mean, your body temperature will heat up um, to, you know, 100, 110, 115, 120 degrees. You can't go directly in the cold water. You'll have a stroke. So you have to cool down for 20 or 30 minutes, and that is an occasion, again, for um, a light meal, some tea, uh, conversation where you're sitting around wrapped in a towel, allowing your body to cool down before you actually move into uh, the cold water. Uh, this is a section through... Um, uh, one of these baths, through that bath, actually. And um, you can see here the furnace room, which is using not only wood but also animal manure dung to burn. Um, to, to, to burn. And then this is the large room, which we're going to go into in a moment. And then here we see the sweat rooms. The controversy, it's not really a controversy, but there's a large question, unknown, for which there's no answer. Did, did the Romans take this from someone else, or did... This derived from the Roman type. There were baths in the Greek world, but they were associated with gymnasia. They were associated with um, exercise. And, and they, so they weren't baths like we have in the Roman world, these great sort of institutions, social institutions that everybody went to, whole families, extended families, all your friends, a whole neighborhood would sort of convene there. Um, if it was a small neighborhood bath, you would have, as this does, the, this is actually saying, uh, it's letting you know that this is the women's day or this is the men's day. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday or something would be for um, women and Monday, Wednesday, for that sort of thing would be for men. Large baths, of course, had separate facilities um, uh, segregated by the sexes. Um, so if we go into that large room, what we see here is exactly what's going on. These guys are smoking uh, cigarettes, <laughs> um, and uh, that's what this is, because uh, it's very low light in there. That's what you're looking at here. But uh, you have a cool water jet in a pond here so that you can sort of splash a little. If you overheat, you can sort of splash yourself down. But then we go sit up here um, and have conversation and so forth, waiting on your body temperature to cool down before you actually immerse yourself into uh, a cold bath. The, um, this is actually another one of those, those rooms. You can see the jets of water coming up. Simple to do. You get water that's held at a higher elevation. It then puts a head pressure on it, and it, it just simply flows by gravity. Reconstruction of the hypocaust system, exactly the way the, Romans, the Roman bath worked. And then you can see there the 
uh, the flues that are actually um, coming into the wall cavity here and then heating it, and then hot water is actually coming out into this basin that we see right here. Uh, the backs of these, the back of the house of a bath is not a pretty sight. It is um, interesting nonetheless, very interesting. Um, uh, here the, the, the wagon, the beluga wagon, is actually bringing in uh, fuel. This is actually the furnace room that we see here and then the exhaust coming up out there. And then these guys who are working there um, who were very happy to see us when we were there. Uh, Sana'a has, uh, it's a World Heritage Site, and it has some of the most remarkable uh, and unique buildings in the world. These are residential buildings. They date to the 11th and 10th centuries, as far back as the 11th and 10th centuries of the Common Era. Um, very old. And they are organized not totally unlike what you would see in a caravanserai, and by that I mean that the garage where you would sort of store your, your, your animals would be down here on the ground floor and then you would have a sort of piano nobile. Then you would have a women's section here. Then you would have a men's section here and then the grandfather who was sort of the head of the household would have the penthouse. And the bathrooms were on the top floor and that becomes significant as we'll see in a moment. Uh, these are worked uh, plaster with alabaster insets and very thin stone that is translucent, um, absolutely incredible. You know, whenever I hear of conflict and what's going on in Aleppo right now in Syria, it's tragic, uh, because I, I, as, as much as I, the human being in me mourns the loss of human life, um, you know, I would hope that my descendants have the opportunity to see these buildings someday. You know, it's the loss of something that is irreplaceable here in, in every sense of the word. So coming into one of these houses, uh, you've left your, your uh, pack animal on the, on the ground floor. You're now coming up to this sort of reception room or vestibule. And then from there, you would move up into the piano nobile, up into the main living room uh, where the whole family would gather for meals and so forth. And then you would continue up, uh, segregated again by women and men with the grandfather on the very top. These are minarets, of course, for call to prayer. But you get this uh, extraordinary sense of the landscape, the skyline, so to speak, of, of, these, of these houses. Now, the bathroom was on the very top. And um, you would have um, water and a pitcher or a bowl would be set up here. And then the solid material that you see here would actually go down into a pit. It's like a cesspit. Uh, the liquid, you'd wash yourself off, clean yourself. The liquid, including urine, would flow down uh, the outside of the building in, in, along this kind of vertical gutter, where it would then go down into the sewer system that would, the old wadi that had been covered over or something that would take, take this out. Um, this soil. Uh, the night soil here, the solid matter, would be then um, dried out, and it would typically have a trap door along the street where you could then harvest it. And this is uh, very rich in nutrients for plants, and these would be taken out and used in these gardens, which uh, are in this interstitial space between these streets. So walking along the street, you would have no idea that this is actually there. Uh, after the arrival of Islam, uh, these came into the control of the mosque. They were considered to be collective spaces. And uh, this is actually an irrigation system uh, that's an old Egyptian device called a shaduf that would actually have a counterweight and a bucket would go down and pick it up. And the, the uh, camel here is actually providing the horsepower, so to speak, the camel power, so to speak, for this. Now, um, I don't want to leave the impression that all of these cities uh, are still medieval. They are not medieval any more than Paris today is medieval, or Florence is medieval, or York, England is medieval. In fact, uh, these cities continue to grow, and in some cases there were planned cities. Baghdad was one. Uh, so I thought it would behoove us to look briefly at this same time period that we're talking about here, roughly from 
the construction of the Duomo in Santa Maria del Fiore, uh, all the way up to, um, to the beginnings of Versailles. Uh, it makes an interesting comparison. It raises more questions than we can answer, and that's all I hope to do. Um, other than general information, that's all I hope to do uh, with this lecture today. So if we look then at Baghdad, a slide we saw on the very first day in this course, we see this dendritic system here with this kind of super block. A large avenue-type street has been cut through this fabric at some point. And the newer parts of the city that date actually to the 19th century uh, are a block structure with clearly uh, a pattern of streets and boundaries that were prior to subdivision, prior to when um, the, um, in other words, the subdivision occurred prior to occupancy, whereas here is a city that is growing by accretion. Uh, this is a city that was clearly planned. Now, much of, um, in the 19th century, much of North Africa and a good bit of, say, Lebanon, for example, came under the control of European colonial powers at a period when um, the English and the French and the Spanish were spreading out um, to some degree, the Portuguese, to some degree, uh, Russia, and so forth, spreading out in Dutch and so forth um, uh, around the world. And um, due to the very complex sort of history of all this, which we really don't have time to, and is really irrelevant for our discussion, um, there was, so there was, a, I mean, if you go to Tunisia today, you go to Morocco today, people are speaking French, right? I mean, you go into a hotel and Marrakesh, and you can speak French to the person behind the counter, if you can speak French. <laughs> um, the, um, and and uh, so there is um, some cases, Marrakesh being one, where uh, the French colonial power, in this case, um, this is Baghdad, um, actually may have created these, um, this sort of imp imposition of these, um, of these Baroque um, ideologies, this looks an awful lot like the Piazza del Popolo or Versailles or something, doesn't it? Um, but, but actually, um, that's not altogether clear. That, uh, in fact, we have evidence going all the way back to the Middle Ages that there were planned cities. Um, and we'll see one of those by the Caliph al-Mansur, who developed a plan for Baghdad, which was really the capital of the Abbasid caliphate uh, for a long period of time until it was conquered by uh, someone else, another group. So Baghdad, the city of Al-Mansur, was originally a round city. Um, it had some sort of, um, it's believed that his architect was actually Persian, meaning from Iran, modern Iran. Um, and because of that, uh, there may have been some Zoroastrian sort of things that somehow found their way into this. Um, we're not sure. Um, this is the great mosque uh, that was in the center. We don't know what this was intended to be used for. It had four main streets, this kind of boulevard that went all the way around, two sets of walls. Then you moved down these streets into, uh, you'll notice these streets are through streets from the outside to the interior at the gates. And then these streets do not connect. So this connects from here to here around to the next main street, and it produced tiers of rabads, or neighborhoods. Um, and along these main streets were shops and so forth that um, uh, we, do, we do know that. Now, the reason we don't know any more about this is because none of it remains. Uh, for whatever reason, it was completely destroyed. After al-Mansur's founding of this city at Baghdad, um, there was a second city that was founded across the river. That's not uncommon. You see that, for example, in Budapest, right? There were two cities that were uh, across the river that eventually, through Sinoicism, kind of grew into one urban complex. Uh, and even today in the United States, Cincinnati and Covington, Kentucky, Covington, a little bitty place, Cincinnati, a great big city, but they're directly across the river from one another. Uh, or Columbus, Georgia, and Phoenix City, Alabama, uh, where a lot of people in Columbus are now moving because of lower taxes. <laughs> um, so this apparently had cosmological significance. Uh, the, the reason it's thought to have been Zoroastrian has to do with this Persian connection and the foreness, uh, which was in all of the, it goes back to the Rig Veda, it goes way back in time, 
this fourness. And four is a number that I think is, we see it everywhere. I mean, you see it absolutely everywhere, north, south, east, west. You see it in Cardo and Decumanus, left, right, front, back. There's something fundamentally human about this fourness. There were four rivers of paradise in the Garden of Eden. There are four gospels in Christian theology, etc., that were accepted into the canon. Uh, this fourness um, actually then um, seems to have originated in Iran, and we'll see in a moment uh, the, the very name Bag, B-A-G-H, Bag, actually means garden, and uh, a char bag, a four-part garden, is, um, is also something that appears in, certainly in Isfahan as late as 1550 of the Common Era. This is one of those streets looking down the retail street from, um, from the gate here coming in. Um, and then the second sort of um, street network that we see here. And then 40 of these shop bays have been omitted before we enter into this large, uh, large uh, square or it's actually around this large public space. Um, there have been many attempts to reconstruct this from what little evidence we have. Uh, this is one of them. Um, and you, the diff, part of the difficulty in figuring out where it is today, again, no trace of this remains. It was on the Tigris River, Tigris. Um, but um, is that the river has shifted in its course. So when you see that, for example, today, this shoreline might be here because of the action of the of the current eroding here and building up on the other side. Uh, we see this, the, the river shifting in Paris. I've already talked about that. Uh, these happen all the time. It does not bode well for the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, right? unfortunately. So here is modern Baghdad, and we see the, 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 the oldest mosque is actually here. So the, one assumption is that it was in this area, that round city. But if we look at the general uh, alignment of the river or the layout of the river, it may well have been down in here somewhere. So there's one group of people who believe that it must have been here. There's another group that believes that it was down here. Uh, that's fine. We have absolutely no idea where it was because nothing really remains of it. Now, if we go to Samarkand, uh, Samarkand is in uh, Central Asia. I believe today it is Uzbekistan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was positioned on the Silk Road, the main trade route between China and the West. Uh, Samarkand was noted for being an Islamic center for scholarly study. Uh, in the 14th century, it became the capital of the empire of a man named Timur. He goes by a number of names, Timur or Tamerlane, to use the English name. Um, he was the ancestor of the Mughal empires uh, of the Mughal Empire uh, in India, the people who built the Taj Mahal, for example. Um, and I want to focus, clearly this is planned. It was not planned by any European colonial power. It was planned uh, clearly by uh, the architects of Tamerlane. And um, he is uh, buried there today. But I want to focus in on this, um, the Registan because the Registan actually um, is built, is constructed almost um, in, in, in this very same time period that we're talking about from the Piazza Santissima Annunziata to the beginning of Versailles, including all the royal places and so forth. And here it is today. Now, this garden form that we see here is called a charbag, um, and uh, it has lots of associations, and we don't have time to get into it in this course, but... Again, this is a, it, it originally meant a four-part garden. So when you see the term char bag, C-H-A-H-A-R in English, B-A-G-H, bag, bag in, um, in, in, in English also, um, it means char, meaning four, kahar, four, four part. Uh, there were three schools that were built here uh, over time in this extraordinary complex using a lot, there's clearly a lot of Persian influence in this, the squinch arch, the decorative tiles, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the Ulug Beg Madrasa, which was built during, during the Timurid Empire, 1417 to 1420. 
And uh, it formed one of the three, the other Sherdor that we see here, meaning having tigers. There we see these tigers up here over the portal, the main portal. And then here, the Tiliakori, I'm not sure it means gilded or golden. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. Uh, it was a two-story main facade with a vast courtyard fringed by dor dormitory cells with four galleries along the axes. The mosque building is situated in the western section of the courtyard. The main hall of the mosque is abundantly gilded. That is gold inlay uh, and ceramic tile. That's what it looks like. So you have this enormous, almost renaissance, really, I mean, so we're looking at something that has that, that's very similar to uh, Bacon's principle of the second man, right? Where you have one that begins. Uh, let's see which one is that. That is this one. Then a second one is built, and then a third one is built, or a third one is built, second one is built, and a third one is built, which then completes this over about a 150 to 200 year period in the exact same time period that we see these developments occurring in Italy and later in France. Um, it makes, um, it raises, as I said, an enormous number of questions for which there are no answers. Did one influence the other? Possibly, but we have no evidence of that. It appears that they developed um, along similar lines completely independently of one another. Now, one of the most famous of these planned cities was uh, constructed between 1550 begun in 1550 and about 1600 uh, A.D. or 970 um, um, after the Hajj in a Muslim time. Um, and um, I want to kind of go through this because this is really an extraordinary. This is in Iran, still there. It's a huge city, Isfahan today. Um, and what you'll notice at the top up here, at one is a, a sort of wiggling street. This is the caravan route that is coming into the city, and one is the old Medan, this, this market, like I was talking about before, that occurred, this big sort of public square that occurred on the outskirts of the city, really out into an open area. And it became uh, quite important economically, and eventually a city began to grow around it. Shah Abbas, uh, in 1550, decided to make this his capital. And as a result, he then um, implemented this extraordinary plan uh, which is still at the core of, uh, of Isfahan today, even though it's a very large city, a million and a half, two million people uh, all around it. So what we're looking at here is the sort of something which is occurring um, almost simultaneously with Place Dauphine, Richelieu, et cetera. It's really extraordinary. Now, uh, as we move in past the old Maidan, this, this former sort of square, we come down through the uh, market buildings that grew up along the caravan route and into this formal bazaar that we see here, which is very famous, globally famous, in fact. And uh, then four and five are occupying, um, four is really the new Maidan, and the bazaar is on one side, and the mosque that we see rotated at position two here is... Um, is actually um, similar in terms of the public space to what we saw in Richelieu, with the market on one side and the church on the other. Um, there's a lot of debate about what this was actually used for because it's, it's huge. And the general agreement is that it must have been a polo field, possibly. Um, it could have been for um, a space to review the troops because there is actually a pavilion uh, here above this portal and here where you actually, the Shah could sit and overlook the entire, uh, overlook the entire thing. So you could make an argument that he was watching the polo matches or you could make an argument that he was reviewing the troops. Uh, either way, either one is plausible. Uh, the fact is we don't actually know. Uh, but from this portal at number seven that we see here, called the Alley Kapu, it actually moves in in a straight line down to this huge street that we see here, which was called the Charbag Street, number nine. 
Um, and this was the avenue of the viziers. This was his, his, his ministers, his generals, his interior minister, his secretary of state, etc. cetera, uh, would have been, these were all of their individual houses uh, that were associated actually with the activities um, of the government uh, of, his, of, of his empire. Now, these are actually gardens, and only um, a fragment of this remains today. Today, um, this is actually a beautiful street we'll see in a moment, but it was originally a water course that came down uh, from this top all the way down here to the river, open air, uh, what is called, and to use the Arabic term, a kanat. A kanat was actually an irrigation system that goes back to about 800 uh, years um, before the Common Era and um, w developed in Iran. It was not called a kanat because in Iran they speak a different language. It's not Arabic. Um, and today, Farsi, but old Persian, um, which actually is related etymologically. Uh, Farsi is an Indo-European language, by the way. Um, and Iran takes its name from the word, Hitler got a little confused, from Aryan. Um, these were the Aryans. He was very confused. He thought they were, had blonde hair from, they were Nordic. They weren't. They were, they were these are the Aryans. Um, and um, thus the name Iran. So this street that we see was originally a water course down the center, and then each one of these gardens kind of opened up onto it. Um, a cannot, I have to do this with my finger. I, I should put a slide in here to, to show you. But what you would do is you would capture snow melt in the mountains uh, or a source of a spring. And then uh, you would build a holding tank and then a shaft that would come down and an underground, um, an underground tunnel that would bring the water in. It's thought that David Stronach, a scholar of this world, believes it may have been developed by miners, um, but it, to, to dewater the mines, we're not sure. But anyway, it was put into, into use as an irrigation system. Well, there's a point where you're coming downhill where it would then erupt into a flat plain, and it would move into a holding basin, a distribution tank, where it would then be distributed in various directions for different purposes. Uh, that's fairly common. The Romans did something similar, but the geometry, the precision of the geometry of these four-part gardens that we see here, along with all the tradition of Mughal gardens, Taj Mahal, all of that uh, actually comes from this, this kanat, this system of kanats. And there is one at, um, at Pasargadai, which uh, goes all the way back to the Achaemenid uh, Empire, 600, uh, 7th century before the Common Era, and is also evident at Persepolis, which was the um, capital of the um, of Cyrus, uh, one of the Cyruses, Cyrus the Great. In any event, um, very little of this remains, so we are only seeing fragments of those, this one, for example, that still remains. This is that street that we see today. Here is the, the mosque that we see rotated to face the Kaaba, face Mecca. And then here is actually the entrance into, and that bazaar, is, it sort of doesn't show up here, but it's this huge complex that we see here, and then this sort of road this, that, that now has almost disappeared into the urban fabric. Uh, so what we see over here, again, this is not due to any European colonial influence. This is something that was developed by, entirely by uh, Shah Abbas and his architects who were Persian. This is Iran. That's Persia. Um, this is then, so let's go in. This is the bazaar. Um, absolutely fantastic uh, building. This is the entrance then um, uh, to the Maidan Isha from, um, from um, the bazaar. And there is the Maidan looking uh, in the opposite direction uh, toward the great Friday mosque. Um, it's sort of interesting how they dealt with it. You actually enter here then into this courtyard, and then the, the mosque itself, the mihrab, of course, faces uh, Mecca, but you are, you are uh, sort of separating it into two parts, this part which is rectified to this geometry and this part which is rectified to Mecca. 
you can see the enormity of this, and then if we look at it from the other side, you'll notice that where they didn't have enough actual program, they went ahead and built, like at Place Vendôme, went ahead and built the facade up so that you could have this kind of uniform height around the entire thing, allowing the monumental buildings um, to actually uh, be read against this foil, against this background of this great, of this great space. There is actually then the rotation that we see. I'll go through these quickly. This is the viewing platform that I referred to earlier. It's actually the house of his father. And then the char bag that we see, this is a carpet. Again, you see these are water courses from a central distribution tank. There's one that still remains, so you have to imagine in the next slide that that street, in the, in the median of the street here, uh, the Charbag Street actually had one of those water courses running all the way down the length of that street. Quite beautiful street. So you might want to um, study this particular slide because I have been known to put this diagram up and ask you to identify two or three things on it. Okay? Are there any questions? We're out of time. Are there any questions at all? <coughs> 